there's a strange satisfaction in stumbling across a piece of forgotten military engineering that honestly outperforms the gear we rely on today. Whether you're a collector, a fieldcraft enthusiast, or someone who pays close attention to the evolution of survival gear, certain World War II innovations feel almost supernatural. And, you know, the one that continues to puzzle engineers the most was never a weapon, never a tool, never a piece of armor. It was a simple treatment, applied to cloth, that made standard-issue military gear nearly immune to rain, snow, and mud, in a way that modern coatings still struggle to match. Before we had plastics, synthetics, and polymerized waterproof membranes, soldiers were issued fabric that behaved like something out of a laboratory, decades ahead of its time. And this method, which appears in fragmentary manuals and field notes, but was never fully explained or standardized, became the backbone of why some World War II shelters remained dry, in conditions that really should have soaked them through in minutes. For the first minute or so, let's dig into the intrigue behind this. You had armies operating on multiple fronts, from the wet forests of the Ardennes to the monsoon-soaked jungles of the Pacific. Gear was supposed to rot, sag, and leak, yet certain units reported ground sheets and shelter halves that shed water almost instantaneously. Veterans described water beading and rolling off as if the fabric were coated in something invisible. Quartermasters complained that newer batches didn't work the same, which suggests the earlier method required steps that were gradually abandoned or lost as wartime production sped up. And engineers today when testing authentic surviving pieces, find a hydrophobic performance that can't be achieved without either modern fluoropolymers or heavy wax impregnation. Yet the World War II cloth samples contain neither. That's the mystery. Not the fabric, but the treatment. This rainproofing method began with a fabric soldiers considered ordinary, until they noticed its strange behavior under heavy rain. The cloth itself was usually cotton duck, thick, tightly woven, durable, nothing special. But the wartime version had one defining characteristic. The fibers swelled evenly when exposed to moisture, locking themselves into a tighter weave. This meant the fabric didn't rely on a surface coating to repel water. The waterproofing came from the structure tightening itself like a living membrane. Anyone who owns an original World War II British or American shelter half knows this effect well. Touching the underside while wet usually doesn't cause leaking, something you cannot say for modern tarps. When the fabric is original and treated properly, you can pour water on it until it forms pools and it still won't penetrate. What modern engineers still debate is how exactly this swelling behavior was enhanced. Surviving documents refer to, well, things like conditioning baths, oil sets, and dye stabilizers. Some references mention aluminum acetate solutions, which stiffen cellulose fibers and make them contract more uniformly. Others hint at oiling mixtures that, interestingly, never appear in official supply manuals. Recreating these treatments today is possible, but the exact formula used during wartime remains uncertain because, you know, different factories use slightly different mixtures. And yet the effect, when the process was done correctly, was shockingly consistent. 
Modern survivalists can still use this World War II method by understanding how the treatment worked and replicating its principles with accessible materials. Unlike plastic tarps, this fabric becomes more waterproof as it becomes wet, which makes it ideal for shelters, lean-tos and improvised ground covers. If you want to apply a version of this method today, you can recreate the swelling action by starting with tightly woven cotton canvas. The first step is to wash the cloth in very hot water, then dry it on high heat. This tightens the weave before any treatment begins. The next step is to soak the cloth in a mixture of alum, which is potassium aluminum sulphate, and warm water. This stiffens the fibres while keeping them flexible enough to bind more tightly under pressure. After drying it fully, a very light oiling mixture can be applied, traditionally boiled linseed oil thinned with mineral spirits, although, you know, modern users often prefer tongue oil for its lower tendency to mildew. But the critical part is moderation. World War II fabric wasn't greasy or waxy. It relied primarily on the fibre reaction, not a thick surface coat. Used correctly, this treated fabric becomes a survival tool with advantages modern synthetics simply can't replicate. For one, it is quiet. Hunters and recon scouts in World War II relied on material that wouldn't crackle at the slightest movement. Second, it works even after being punctured. Small tears do not spread because the fibres are already under tension from swelling. Third, it withstands heat far better than nylon or polyethylene. A World War II style shelter half can be pitched beside a fire without melting, warping or giving off toxic fumes. And fourth, if the cloth becomes damaged in the field, the repair process is straightforward. Needle, thread and pressure. No adhesives, no heating, no specialised patches. This method shows why older survival gear deserves a second look, instead of being dismissed as outdated. The mistake many beginners make is assuming that modern polymers outperform everything that came before them. But, you know, history shows the opposite whenever fabric technologies are studied carefully. The World War II rainproofing method is a perfect example of engineering built on natural materials behaving exactly as soldiers needed them to. Even today, reenactors, bushcrafters, and long distance trekkers, you know, actually reproduce these treatments intentionally because they outperform cheap tarps and last for years instead of just months. If you're someone who appreciates survival gear with a past, well, this is definitely one of those skills worth bringing back into circulation. Test it on a small piece of canvas first. Then compare it to a standard tarp during a rainstorm. Track how water behaves differently between the two. You'll understand immediately why soldiers trusted this method and, honestly, why collectors still shake their heads at just how well it performs. If you found this guide helpful and want more deep dives into lost techniques, forgotten tools and the survival skills our ancestors took for granted, make sure to subscribe to the channel, share this video and help keep history alive for the next generation of enthusiasts.